Yo, little kids, turn off your TVs and listen to me. We about to do our ABCs. Y'all ready? Hey yo, A is for the AIDS, B is for the bullets, C is for the crime, D is for the dealers, he's for education, F is for freedom, G is for gangsters, everywhere I see him, H is for Hampton. It is September 26th, 2024. You're listening to A Different Lens, a podcast produced by the Hampton Institute. Today we're talking to Eli Mori of Indie Liberation Center about Venezuela, specifically the elections that took place in July and what has been going on domestically and the fallout of those elections uh, internationally as well. As we can see in the news as of recent, Argentina has ordered the arrest of President Maduro and one of his ministers. Um, and so in this interview as well, we discuss the relationship between uh, Venezuela and Argentina and how that has changed over time. Listen in. Hey, Eli, thank you for coming on the show, man. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I appreciate you. I'm honestly really excited to be on the show. So thanks for inviting me. Yeah, man. Yeah, let's do this. Um, so tell us about yourself. Yeah, so uh, my name is Eli Mori. Uh, I'm an organizer with uh, Answer Coalition, specifically the Indiana, Indiana chapter called Answer Indiana. Um, my introduction to anti-imperialism and like the, the anti-imperialist struggle started with my experiences living abroad. So when I was 18, I lived in Argentina for a year. And while I was there, I lived there and worked there. I was there just like working at various different like hostels and stuff and, and learning, trying to learn Spanish, uh, which I did. Um, but I, when I was there, I ended up meeting several people who, uh, either they or people they knew had like family or friends who had been disappeared by the dictatorship uh, in Argentina. Argentina was one of several countries in Latin America that had a U.S. backed dictatorship in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, and so that was like, you know, I, I maybe had heard about this before, but like meeting people firsthand who had had that experience was like a totally different uh, thing for me. And so that like really kind of piqued my interest and made me like want to learn more about all of the horrible things that the United States had been doing. I, you know, I'd been aware, I'd, I'd sort of been on my radar since I was a kid because my parents had taken me and my siblings to like anti-Iraq war protests and stuff when we were little. Um, and then in 2019, I went to Palestine um, to teach English for a summer and I lived in the West Bank and taught English. And again, got to see firsthand just all of the havoc that the United States is wreaking in the world and like how you know, people in Palestine are living this, you know, really horrible existence, basically, uh, you know, under occupation, and it's all funded by the United States and supported diplomatically and economically by the United States. So all of that kind of primed me to want to be involved in the like anti-imperialist struggle generally. And I actually joined Answer in January 2020. I met them organizing a protest against uh I don't know if you remember that that was when uh, Trump had uh, the Iranian general Qassem Soleimani uh, murdered and there was sort of a, a risk that the U.S. would go to war with Iran. So there was a protest for that. Um, but since then, I've been involved in an answer uh, here in Indianapolis. So going back four years now, we've been involved in a lot of local struggles. And I, I might talk a little more about this later on. Uh, I realize I'm being a little long winded with my intro, but, um, you know, not just, uh, you know, our, our name, Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. It's not like we just randomly threw the two issues of war and racism together. They really go hand in hand. Every time there is an imperialist project, a war, a coup, a sanctions regime, it goes hand in hand with like racist demonization. I actually think we can see this so clearly with like Haiti and how at the same time the U.S. right now is trying to go after Haiti and and occupy Haiti. There's this demonization here at home in the United States of Haitian immigrants who are coming here because of the havoc that we've wreaked on their country. So, um, yeah, that's. I think that's about me and about answer. Uh, hopefully, that's a good introduction. If you have any other questions, feel free to to ask. But no, man, that's a really good introduction. And yeah, don't worry about being long-winded, man. The more the the, the more the better, honestly. Um, but yeah, no, man, that's dope that you've actually gone and visited a couple of. Um, Countries Latin America, some you know visiting Palestine. I think those are 
very like unique experiences that a lot of people don't get to have. And yeah, I think that more people at least were able to, um, you know, because I, I sat back and I thought about it a lot of times, you know, how there are so many people here in the U.S. who they get up, they live, they die in America, you know, and I could be, this could be a wrong stat, but it's something like I think most people live within like 50 miles or whatever of their hometown, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So like the idea of, because people want, a lot of times are like, hey, you know, why, you know, are people just believing whatever government says or believing whatever the media says? It's like, because they don't have perspective, right? And they can't really have perspective if a different perspective, you can't travel to access a different perspective. Now you can read, right? You can research. And, but even then that can only do so much, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, to be fair, I have comrades, uh, you know, an answer who have never been to another country, barely have been out of Indiana, who are just as fervently anti-imperialist as I am. I don't think it's necessarily a requirement, but I do agree with you. I think that it's it just like in my case, like I said, it, I knew about Palestine. I knew about the dictatorships in Latin America. I knew about, you know, all kinds of stuff before I went there. But seeing it for yourself in, impels you to action because you see like the very real consequences of the damage that the United States is doing around the world. Um, reading about it is different from knowing somebody personally who's like, you know, in Palestine, for example, who's had members of their family killed by the IDF or you know, their future is messed up because they, you know, got a scholarship to go to university somewhere and they couldn't leave their city or they couldn't leave the West, they couldn't leave the West Bank or they couldn't leave Gaza because uh, Israel's, because of Israel's like, you know, anyway. So that's, I I, I just wanted to say, I I think I do agree with you on that, uh, that it's, it's not a prerequisite, but it is, you know, really useful to be able to see for yourself just like how much the U.S., how much damage is really done by U.S. imperialism at like a personal like level. Yeah, and the thing, it also makes those, not just your conviction stronger, but like you said, right, knowing someone who's like, who event, these events have happened to, right, things have happened to, like you said, it makes it that much more real. So you're like, oh, wow, this isn't just text on a book this isn't just a um a you know numbers right this is a statistic right but this is a real living breathing person who has been negatively impacted you know and even if it's only one person you know it can still um i i think make a big difference in one's worldview and like yeah i agree you travel is not necessary um but i think it helps a lot it helps a lot, a lot. yeah i mean I'll just the one the last thing I'll say on this is, uh, you know, a lot of people, you kind of have to take the step from a lot of people, their first exposure to socialism or anti imperialism or whatever is that they get exposed to it online, and they kind of have their mind opened, and they hear new perspectives and things they hadn't heard before. But what impels people to action is having their heart opened, like have and that is, I think, whether it's experiencing personally, like in your city, like police violence or, or getting to go to another country and seeing other people from those countries suffering because of U.S. imperialism. I think that's the thing that, um, like drives people to actually start being an active force in like the anti-war movement and, you know, the anti-police brutality, whatever, whichever movement you're talking about. I think that that like personal experiences really plays a big role. Yeah. Um, so obviously, right, we are here to discuss the situation in Venezuela, um, the ongoing situations primarily surrounding their recent election. Um, and so I wanted to ask in that vein, right, talk about Nicolas Maduro, right, who he is, how he came to power, and likewise, who was his opponent, Edmundo Gonzalez, and why did the U.S. choose to support him? Yeah, um, and again, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to talk about this subject. I think it's really important because, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but like every time I turn on the radio or like look at the news, uh, the mainstream news in the last like couple of months, it's just one thing after another, like slander, like just, oh my God, like Nicolas Maduro is like cutting babies' faces off or something. Like, I, I don't know where they're getting this stuff from, but like, it's just a new crazy headline every day. So I think it's important for us to like, dig in and figure, you know, teach people like, what are the actual facts of this situation? So Nicholas Maduro is a great place to start because there's 
so much slander against him. Um, you can't, re- although I'll start by saying you can't really talk about Maduro without talking about Hugo Chavez. So Hugo Chavez was the charismatic leader of, of Venezuela from 1999 until his death in, I believe, 2014. Um, and Maduro is his successor. Maduro is the person who he uh, and his party like decided was going to take Chavez's place once Chavez uh, passed away. Um, but let's go back and talk a little bit about Chavez first, just to give people sort of a framing of where Maduro and his party and this whole movement came from. So Venezuela has enormous oil reserves. I think a lot of most people know that. Uh, it's actually at this point they have the largest known oil reserves in the world, um, largest oil producing country in the Western Hemisphere. And for many decades in the 20th century, Venezuela was basically a puppet of the United States. The ruling class in Venezuela basically existed, you know, to as like a sort of neo-colonial apparatus that allowed the U.S. ruling class to extract natural resources, mainly oil from Venezuela. And Chavez, when Chavez came to power in 1999, it was on a wave of popular support. It was, uh, you know, he won sort of by an overwhelming margin. And the reason he won was because he promised like total change, beginning with a new constitution, uh, which was written with the active participation of everybody in the country. So like people all over the country participated in writing it, which is very unlike, you know, the United States Constitution, which was written by a bunch of like fucking old white sorry can i cuss on this podcast uh a bunch of anyway yeah man go for it cuss away uh but anyway written by a bunch of like old slave owners uh with no input from the people and basically exists you know to like stifle a lot of the rights of the people in the case of venezuela written by in part the people of the country and then adopted by popular referendum so instead of just writing it and then passing it they basically, after it was written, Chavez said, okay, now we're going to have a vote around the country. We're going to see if people support this constitution. It was voted in. People, you know, what wanted this new constitution. And one of the things that the constitution did, really the main thing, was elevating the class of the working and the poor in Venezuela and giving them access to real power um, to direct the courts of the country's development, which was something they really hadn't had ever in Venezuela's history uh, since the Spanish colonial period through to uh, the beginning of this period, which has be- come to be known as the Bolivarian Revolution, read, led by Chavez. Um, and well, well, we can talk uh, later on about some of the ways in which like that concretely um, happened. Um, so... I think I, I have more about to say about, about Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution later, but I want to emphasize a few things uh, before I get to Maduro, which is under the leadership of Chavez and then later Maduro, some really like notable achievements were made in spite of ongoing attempts by the U.S. to sabotage Venezuela's socialist project. You know, the U.S. Um, for the last 10 years has basically been totally uh, suffocating Venezuela with with sanctions, which is part of why the uh, oil crisis there had, had was so bad and why their economy has, has suffered so much. Um, there's also several instances of the U.S. backing coups, um, attempting to overthrow the democratically elected government of Venezuela. Um, but in spite of that, the, the Bolivarian Revolution has not been overthrown. It's continued from 1999 or 1998 until today. The main vehicles for the achievements that were made throughout the Bolivarian Revolution that you know, basically bettered the lives of working people all across Venezuela uh, is something called misiones, which is Spanish for missions, uh, which are basically long-term economic and social development programs. So to name a few, uh, the Bolivarian government since uh, 1998 has built over 4 million new homes uh, for poor people living in substandard housing as a part of a mission called Misión Habitat, Mission Habitat. Um, those, you know, in a country, Venezuela is, doesn't have hundreds of millions of people in it, like the United States, 4 million uh, new homes uh, basically given for free to people who were previously living in, you know, either didn't have a home or were living in very substandard housing. That's like an incredible um, achievement, especially for a country that's, that's suffering from sort of economic uh, pressure from the United States. The Bolivarian government has also 
uh, helped over 100 million poor Venezuelans uh, get access to subsidized food under a program called Misión Mercal. Uh, there's another mission called Misión Barrio Adentro, which built thousands of clinics and community centers in an effort to give people free health care and dental care all across Venezuela. Um, one other one that I'd like to mention is uh, a massive literacy campaign in the early 2000s, basically like at the beginning of Chavez's time in power that taught over a million people in Venezuela how to read and write. Um, one other thing that emerged out of this, out of the Bolivarian Revolution was the communes, which basically are sort of like local uh, bodies that devolve decision-making power to localities and give working people in in villages and remote like remote villages and neighborhoods and uh, autonomy and decision-making power over their lives that they never really had before so all of this is to say this is why chavez and later maduro have been able to stay in power in spite of all of the pressure from the united states it's not through violence it's not through sheer force uh as the united states would like you to believe you know the headlines in the u.s are opposition you know the opposition Everybody hates Maduro, but he's just cracking down so hard on the opposition. The fact of the matter is a huge uh, portion of the population in Venezuela supports the Bolivarian Revolution uh, and supports Maduro because their lives have been tangibly, uh, you know, bettered by all of these different misiones, by the establishment of the communes. Um, and this is, you know, it's even more understandable that they would do that because the other option, the alternative, is an extremely racist, pro-American, pro-corporate, right-wing opposition. And I think we're, we'll talk about them more later, but, uh, you know, basically those are the two options. There isn't an in-between. There's no, like, third way between socialism and capitalism in Venezuela. It's either you're a puppet of the United States or you, as, as Venezuela is doing right now, forge a new path that incurs the wrath of the United States. Um, Maduro, I'll say one last thing about him. He's not as charismatic as Hugo Chavez. I don't think, I'm not sure anyone in the world is. I don't know if you've seen videos of Hugo Chavez, but he was just this magnetic personality. He was, you know, basically the face of this revolution and really inspired a lot of people. Maduro doesn't necessarily have that exact same charisma, but he is the figurehead of the Bolivarian Revolution. People recognize him as the successor of Chavez. And the hopes and dreams of poor and working and indigenous Venezuelans are tied up with the fate of the Bolivarian Revolution, which Maduro represents. Um, hopefully that's a good start to that to that question. Yeah, no, that is a good start. Um, and you talking about, uh, you know, how the media portrays the situation as, you know, everybody hates Maduro, but he's just still in power somehow. And in some ways it reminds me of Syria, right? Where this whole thing was, oh, uh, Assad is this evil individual. Uh, he's but well, he's still in power. It's like okay, just logically thinking about, about it logically, right? This person wouldn't be in power, even like okay, if the majority disliked him, okay. But if you're saying you're saying like nobody likes this dude, or at least mm -hmm. one majority don't like him, like that just doesn't make sense because logically there would have to be at least a a, a significant portion of the population that does support someone like Assad or does for someone mm -hmm. like Maduro because, right, he just, him being in power, period, unless you're telling me that, like, he's controlling everybody one through fear, which like, once again, it's impossible to do. Like, it, it yeah, just doesn't make sense. It's a very Hollywood idea of how power works. That's, that's like that, you know, uh, anyway, that's all I'll say about that, but it's it's not a very uh sophisticated understanding of how power works exactly um but yeah go and talk about it because you mentioned in the article um right in this recent election uh maduro's opposition was a guy named edmundo gonzalez who was supported by the u.s so who is this dude because um it kind of reminds me of some situations of like juan guaido where everyone was saying oh uh the latest love juan guaido we actually look into it and it's like nobody really knows who guaido is he's just some like more or less random guy that the u.s just picked yeah no i mean that's you you hit the nail on the head the fact of the matter is i don't have that much to say about edmundo gonzalez because he's not um 
he doesn't really have a history. Exactly like Juan Guaido, he's this person who kind of just popped out of nowhere um, as like the figurehead um, of the of the opposition once uh, Maria Karina Machado, who is the who is a, a more influential, I think, really more of the the true figurehead of the opposition. Um, and I think we'll talk about her more later. But basically, you know, Edmundo Gonzalez, I never had heard about him. I'm a person who cares a lot about Venezuela, was interested in Venezuela. Uh, like, wh- I watched their politics closely. Before six months ago, a year ago, I'd never heard this man's name before. I have, I imagine that much like Guaido and some of these other, like, characters who the uh, U.S. media kind of trots out, I don't think we're going to hear about him that much more, much longer. Actually... Um, I'm not sure if you saw the news, but he actually has fled Venezuela and gone to Spain. Um, he's gone into exile in Spain, uh, which is where most of the dictators of Latin America, once they were overthrown, uh, you know, the most of the U.S. backed dictators of, of Latin America, once they're overthrown, they go to, to Spain and live out the rest of their days, you know, just chilling, getting, you know, <laughs> being being rich and I don't know, doing something in Venezuela. I don't know what they do or in in Spain. But yeah, no, I mean, I, there's not that much to say about him. He was basically propped up as like this uh, Juan Guaido figure who the U.S. could say, look, he, the people support him. I don't think even every, a lot of people in Venezuela knew who he was before a year ago. Um, And I think it will be, you know, the, I think a person who we could talk a little bit more about is Karina, uh, Maria Karina Machado, who is, uh, he basically ran in the place of, um, but yeah, like him himself, n- not a very notable figure. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. And so you also know in the article that um, the U.S. is pointing to a number of different polls, um, talking, point, right, saying that the opposition has won. Right, and you point out the issues with these polls, right? But my thing as well is, why would people cite polls to prove that the opposition won, especially given our recent electoral history, for example, in 2016, when all the polls were saying that Clinton was going to win, but then Trump wins, or even the polls today between Kamala and Trump, right? Everyone more or less agrees that the polls can say one thing, but the reality of a situation can be very, very different. So why even cite polls? Yeah, no, this is a great question. Um, I liked your point. Uh, you know, first off, polls are often very inaccurate. I sometimes wonder when the, you know, when I see polls, like who is getting polled? Because I've personally never been polled. I don't know anyone who has been polled. Have you ever been polled before? No, I, I like I've never been polled, and I yeah, and I'm gonna say I'm like, who's getting polled? I'm coming from like, yeah, you're polled, polled, and they're like, no. I'm like, okay, who 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 are these people? Yeah, who are these people who are getting these phone calls? So so that's that's one point is polls are often very inaccurate, um, and not to, not to totally discount polls, but I think that's that's a good point to start with. But I'll also say, when I started seeing these articles in the lead up to the to the uh, elections in Venezuela, I was fascinated because I, w- I was seeing these headlines like Maduro is trailing the opposition by 40 points. And I was like, wow, that's like unprecedented. I've like never seen an election anywhere in the world with a margin that wide. Um, and knowing all of the you know BS that the US has gotten up to in Venezuela, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna look into these polls a little bit and like see where they're coming from, because I'm curious, like they, they cite these same two or three polls in all of these articles on CNN and MSNBC and whatever. And I'm like, I'm going to actually go and just see where these polls came from and who did them and what their methodology was. And you don't have to dig that deep to realize how ridiculous these polls are. So if you're OK with it, I'm just going to read a little excerpt from uh, an article that I wrote about Venezuela uh, that was published on the Hampton Institute website. Um, and just talk a little bit about um, each of these polls that I that I sort of mention and the very blatant conflicts of interest that they have. So the first one is a poll called. So there's there were three polls that came out before the election. One is called Encuestadora Mega Analysis. That's the company that did it, and they're. I'm not sure they've ever done a poll before. They basically seem to be an anti-Maduro Facebook page and like 
podcast. They like have basically a Facebook page that's full of these videos of people denouncing Maduro, saying Maduro's a dictator, the Bolivarian Revolution is a sham, we want freedom, blah, blah, blah. So it's it's basically an openly anti-Maduro like media outlet. Um, and as far as I could tell, I, I dug, if other people want to dig deeper and see if they can find something, I would be happy to be proven wrong. But they did not put anything up about their sample size, about their methodology, anything like that. So I'm ready to discount that one. I'm going to say, okay, if they're openly anti-Maduro, they have a vested interest in not in, you know, denouncing Maduro and they don't have anything about their methodology. It looks like the poll is actually conducted online, like on Facebook. I'm going to say, okay. The next one is a poll from a group called Delphos, which is in Caracas. And I couldn't really find anything about this group except for the fact that it is directed by a man named Felix Cejas Rodriguez. He is an outspoken member of the Venezuelan opposition. Are you starting to see a pattern here? He's authored numerous articles attacking Maduro and even discussing U.S. military intervention against Venezuela. So I, I looked up this guy. I was like, okay, Felix Cejas Rodriguez is the only thing I can find out about this uh this poll this polling company and he has one after another article it's like what are the options for the what are the options for the opposition at this point from back in like 2019 when the last election happened and the top one would always be like u.s intervention what might the u.s intervene and save venezuelan democracy whatever so another very clear conflict of interest the and by the way so these two and then this last one i'm going to mention are the only polls cited by any news in the united states there's no there's no other polls other than these three the last one is by a group called ocr consultores this is a consultancy group whose director osvaldo ramirez colina lives in miami where the group is headquartered this guy studied terrorism and counterterrorism at georgetown university which is notoriously cozy with the cia uh, and he's appeared on news segments and podcast episodes criticizing Maduro and questioning the legitimacy of Venezuela's electoral process. So that's it. Those are the three polls that they had. Um, in none of these cases was there anything apparent about their sample size, about their methodology, anything like that. And in every case, there's a very clear conflict of interest. Then the day after the elections, another poll, an exit poll, which exit polls, by the way, are illegal in Venezuela. Uh, so this was an illegally conducted exit poll by a group called Edison Research. Uh, Edison Research has clients that include CIA-linked U.S. government propaganda outlets, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, and Middle Eastern Broadcasting Networks, all of which are operated by the U.S. Agency for Global Media, a Washington-based organ that's used to spread disinformation against U.S. adversaries. So this uh, this exit poll basically conducted by a group who works with cia cover organizations like radio free europe a uh, voice of america um i also just want to say all about these polls like they are claiming that maduro is losing by 40 points that like for example edmundo gonzalez has 70 percent of the people in the country were going to planning to vote for him and like 15 percent were planning to vote for maduro and it's almost like they like it's ridiculous it's so ridiculous that they almost like mess it up for themselves because if it were if it were a smaller margin i think you could be convinced because there are people who are dissatisfied in venezuela i think we, we're going to talk about this later on but um you know it's not the fact of the matter that three-fourths of people in venezuela are openly not only openly uh you know dissatisfied with Maduro and against Maduro, but actually actively supporting the pro-U.S., uh, um, you know, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for, opposition in Venezuela. Um, it's it's just really pretty ridiculous on its face based on what the actual situation on the ground in Venezuela. Um, if you've, I've seen some videos come out before and after the elections of people talking on, to people on the street in Venezuela. Uh, if you look at there are pictures uh, in some articles, these are harder to find, uh, but there's basically, you know, the PSUV, Maduro's party, had these rallies leading up to the uh, elections, and like sometimes 100,000, hundreds of thousands of people would show up to these rallies. So ultimately, my point is, unless you're willfully blind, you can't believe that these sources are unbiased or that they're going to give you a clear vision of the political landscape in Venezuela. Um, 
And like I said, as far as I could find, I'd be happy if someone could prove me wrong, but I couldn't find a single thing about methodology, sample size, anything like that connected to these polls. If that information is published somewhere, it's not obvious or easily accessible. So yeah, hopefully that answered your question. It definitely did. Um, yeah, just like you're trying to set I'm trying to, I'm not trying to discount polls, right? But it's just, yeah, like you said, something like, so 70% of the country is voting for the opposition. It's like, oh, 15% is voting for Maduro. It's like, okay, well, what, what about that other miss, missing 15%? Like, just undecided? Like, let's, like, yeah, it's by such a large margin that, yeah, if they had, hey, we're ahead by five points. Okay, well, that's believable. 40 points? What? To say you're stretching things is an understatement. Um, but yes, talking about, since you brought it up, right, OCR Consultores, right, you said that the director is based in Miami. Um, but I have to ask as well, right, because um, it was actually interesting, I was talking to some friends about this earlier today, right, um, what does it, like, what good does it do for anyone to comment on the internal going-ons of Venezuela Right, we have people from afar saying they do or don't support it, and I do have some friends who their response was, "Well, it's not about individuals supporting it, but rather they are moneyed interests which are making themselves known and supporting this group or that group in Venezuela or in insert country of choice here." Um, but so, but uh, yeah, what uh, kind of really what impact? What good does it do for someone to comment? on what's going on in Venezuela. Yeah, I'm actually happy you asked this question because it lets me really get to the nub of like Answer Coalition, our stance and my personal stance on Venezuela and the whole global south for that matter, which is we don't really think the US has a right to an opinion uh, on the internal affairs of other countries, on whether or not they're democracies, on whether or not they are, you know, fall, you know, committing human rights abuses or whatever. Um, the U.S. does plenty of that on the global stage and here at home. And we also, of course, don't think that the U.S. has the right, based on these accusations, these unfounded accusations, to sanction, sabotage, and slander these other countries. Uh, ultimately, though, the fate of the Bolivarian Revolution is in the hands of the Venezuelan people, just like the fate of Cuba is in the hands of the Cuban people and the fate of Palestine is in the hands of the Palestinian people. They don't need anything from the United States other than for our government to get its boot off their neck. Um, they have proven, you know, capable of not only defending their revolution and all of the advances that they've made, but, you know, the political development of the people in those countries. I think that's a really important element because the U.S. has crippled the Venezuelan economy. And over the last 10 years, millions of people have immigrated from Venezuela. Some serious damage has been done. You know, the worst multiple times worse than the Great Depression was in the United States in terms of like the, the, the damage to people's quality of life, to the GDP, things like that. In spite of that, people support the Bolivarian, Bolivarian Revolution, not only because in spite of this, they have in some, in many instances, like there, um, there have been gains for the working class, but also because of their political development. They're smart enough, they're savvy enough to realize the reason for our economic hardship is U.S. imperialism. Uh, so, you know, the Venezuelan state media, for all it gets slandered, I think does a good job of informing people in Venezuela of the ways that the that the United States is responsible for the economic catastrophe that's happened in Venezuela. Um, but yeah, so like you know, this is why answer exists. We think that if we can build an anti-imperialist movement here in the heart of the empire, that weakens our government's ability to strangle the rest of the world. Socialist projects, as well as projects of national national development in non-socialist countries, that all of these countries, you know, be it Venezuela, Cuba, Palestine, um, you know, Congo, Niger, Mali. I, anyway, I could list a long list of countries that are sort of in the crossfire or in the crosshairs of the United States. Those countries would be able to re reach their full potential. They're a long way from reaching their full potential right now, and the main reason is the United States. The last thing I'll say about this is. You know, if people in the United States want to have an opinion on Venezuela, they're welcome to have an opinion. Anybody can think whatever they want about anything. But I, one, I would ask people to look deeply into the sources. For example, if you just saw the headlines about these polls, you would think, oh, wow, Maduro was going to lose and then he somehow rigged the election and won. That is easily dispelled if you sort of 
use a critical eye and search the the sources and and like yeah basically like look at the sources and try to figure out where this information is coming from but i'll also say even if you know even if you have a negative opinion of another country anyone with a conscience should be against the basically hybrid war that the united states is waging against like a third of the world right now and i say hybrid war by hybrid war i mean the combination of an information war a sanctions regime in many countries coup attempts if not outright war that the United States has attempted against Venezuela, as well as, you know, dozens of other countries across the world, just in my lifetime, you know, in the last 25, 30 years. These sanctions, these coup attempts have caused nothing but misery for the everyday people of Venezuela. Um, and, and they ultimately haven't even succeeded in their supposed goal of regime change. And the reason for that is because a huge number of people in Venezuela really, truly do support the Bolivarian Revolution. Yeah, I do agree that that's a pretty principled stance. You know, non-interventionism and national sovereignty. Like, yeah, I agree with you. Even if someone does have an opinion on a country, it's like, hey, at least try and make sure it's a legitimately informed opinion, which is a bit difficult in the United States, but for a variety of reasons. But that's a whole other can of worms I don't feel like opening right now. Um, yeah. So regarding transparency of Venezuela's elections, there's been a lot of concern regarding the transparency of voting data. Um, as Human Rights Watch went and posted an article in July, on July 30th of this year um, regarding the election transparency or the voting data transparency. Um, do you think that such concerns are warranted? And where do you think we can get more detailed info, info about some of the actual problems that people have with their government? You know, like, I, because... I, and I think we would both agree here. I think it's kind of it could, it, it's it's kind of ridiculous to sit there and think that every single Venezuelan opposition or not is you know okay, it, you know doesn't have legitimate grievances with the Maduro government. Yeah, so I I like the point you made about you know that in in the first place it's kind of hard to access information about like accurate information about Venezuela in the United States. To some extent, there's like a fog of war, like we can't know what's happening on the ground in Venezuela, partly because the United States government and media doesn't want us to have a clear picture of what's happening on the ground in Venezuela. And we get our information from somewhere. Um, and so people who don't haven't been there personally or don't know people who have been there personally or don't follow our alternative media, you know, are going to have a very hard time finding accurate information about Venezuela. However, I do think, you know, the there are a couple of reasons why the U.S. government's quote-unquote concerns about the transparency of voting data are not warranted. Uh, and I want to I want to reemphasize before I even say any of this the point I made in the last question, which was that I you know whatever the case, the U.S. doesn't have the right to sanction and starve people and try to overthrow the governments of other countries. However, you know for one, ten years ago, which by the way this is what what am I going to say? This is sixteen years into the Bolivarian Revolution. The Carter Foundation, which is a you know liberal U.S. Uh, institution, this was after the Bolivarian Revolution, but just before the U.S. really ramped up its hybrid war, its and its information war on on Venezuela. The Carter Foundation said that Venezuela has among the best election processes in the world. That their election process is basically like incredibly meticulous and uh, well, like just well run. Uh, and, you know, actually to sort of back this up, I'll explain to you a little bit about the electoral process in Venezuela, which is, you know, they have, for being an impoverished country that's been suffering from sanctions, they have a very professional and modern and transparent electoral process with many layers of fraud protection. So votes, for example, are tallied both on electronic machines as well as on paper ballots, which can and are cross-checked following the election. Um, so it's not like you could use the voting machines and uh, just like forge the numbers because everybody is both voting on a machine, uh, which is, you know, relatively secure. Like we use voting machines in the United States and they're tallying their vote on paper and these are cross-checked. Um, another element is that there were close to a thousand international observers in Venezuela for these elections from all around the world. None of them reported major irregular irregularities other than in a few instances, the opposition sort of actively disrupting voting sites or showing up to voting sites long after they'd closed and everyone had voted and demanding to be let in saying that they hadn't been allowed to vote. 
um, et cetera. Um, however, you know, I kind of want to turn the question around because when you make a claim that elections are rigged, I don't think the onus is on, like the United States has no right to investigate Venezuela's election. If the United States is making claims that the elections were rigged, the onus is on them to provide credible evidence. But basically what they're saying is because of these stupid polls and because of we just generally think that we, do, we don't trust and don't like Venezuela, we're going to run on the assumption that these elections were rigged. And the only way that you can escape, uh, you know, U.S., uh, you know, criticism from our media and increased sanctions and all of these things is to somehow prove that you did not engage in election fraud, which is an impossible task because, you, you know, Venezuela can't, other than what they already do, which is, like I said, very professional, a very transparent and professional process. Like, I don't really know what the United States asked for them. Like their National Electoral Council verified the results. Uh, it took a couple days longer than I guess the U.S. State Department would have liked. Um, but the elections were verified by the same, you know, electoral system that has verified every past election in Venezuela. To answer the second part of this question, you know, you're right. There are people who are discontent in Venezuela. In the first place, there are wealthy people who were previously very politically well connected and benefited from working as lackeys of the United States. People who are against the Bolivarian Revolution because their position of privilege in pre revolution Venezuela has been undermined. Um, you know, that's a, a minority because Venezuela historically was not a particularly, like the, the country is incredibly rich, but they had very uh, great poverty before the Bolivarian, Bolivarian revolution. There are also people who are not necessarily for or against the revolution. I think this is a large portion of the people who, I think a large portion of, you know, people who sat out of the election or who voted for the opposition who just ultimately feel desperate for a change after a decade of intense economic warfare by the united states which has caused severe economic damage to venezuela uh, and at the same time you know the, the as much as the u.s media likes to talk about how authoritarian venezuela is venezuela has opposition media and this opposition media is working overtime to convince people in venezuela that the all of their problems the economic uh depression the shortages, that all of these things are solely the responsibility of the Maduro government, uh, that the U.S. has nothing to do with it, that all we need is to overthrow Maduro and the Bolivarian Revolution, and then everything will be great. Uh, and it, I mean, it will be great for, for them, for the very, for the leaders of the opposition. But if you look at Venezuela's history, like the Venezuela was, you know, this sort of false image of a democracy that uh, these opposition figures are claiming that they want to return to for decades and decades in the 20th century. And all that ever brought people in Venezuela, in Venezuela was severe poverty. So, um, you know, Maduro is not necessarily as popular as Chavez was at his height. You know, it, the, in these most recent elections, Maduro won with 51% of the vote, which is a pretty narrow margin compared to a lot of the big wins of Chavez and Maduro in the past. Um, but, you know, I'll emphasize this one more time. If you look at images from before and after the election, Maduro and his party, the PSUV, uh, Partido Socialista Unida de Venezuela, they were having huge rallies with hundred and marches with hundreds of thousands of people in attendance. So to say that, that Maduro simply doesn't have any support um, is kind of a ridiculous claim. Yeah, I get where you're coming from in the sense where, you know, he was making all these claims or, yeah, people making all these claims about, oh, well, it's rigged, it's rigged, it's rigged. And it'd be one thing if it was, it was that was kind of just kind of the standard that was held by, for everyone, you know, where it's like, hey, no matter what country you are, we want to go and double check it. That would be fine. But even then, right, there's no, but with this, right, there's no double checking. It's always consistently against uh, countries, governments, uh, politicians, the United States does not like does not want well actually uh, i'd like to push back a uh, little bit and just say that like i don't think that the u.s has the right to like even if it was doing it to everyone in the world i don't think any country has the right to like meddle in the elections of another country that's basically the definition of sovereignty like that's really what uh the anti-imperialist movement is about is about countries having the right to sovereignty and self-determination and like 
yeah, I think that what I what I'd like to emphasize more than anything is that the elections in Venezuela are like simply not the business of the United States at all. Like they, for us over a century, basically functioned as like a puppet of the United States, and now they finally have so a degree of sovereignty. And this is just one way in which the United States is purposefully attempting to undermine that sovereignty. So sorry, I just wanted to make that. No, no, you're fine. But no, I, I yeah, but no, I I can see where it's coming from. But no, I was making the point where not even necessarily. Um, I don't know, maybe I specified the United States, right? But like I said, one thing in general, if it were like, hey, um, you know, the international community, massive quotation marks, right? If you had, right, observers here in the U.S. making sure our elections went well, like that wouldn't necessarily be uh, opposed to, right? Or if there were just a standard, right? But yeah, it consistently seems to be only an issue when it is a country that is disliked by the U.S. government. Rather than, hey, let's just make it a standard across the board. If you have elections, you're going to have international observers. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't have any, I don't have any examples off the top of my head, but there's plenty of examples of countries in the global south that are allies of the United States that have dictators. Or, I mean, I mean, look at Saudi Arabia, Jordan, these countries oh, that literally yeah. have a hereditary monarchy. Seriously. The U.S. isn't the U.S. isn't hassling them about democracy, uh, so. You know, you have to ask yourself the question, why does the U.S. care so much about Venezuela? And ultimately, it's, you know, two things. One is Venezuela is incredibly rich in natural resources, which the U.S. wants. And two, they, you know, pose the threat of a good example for other countries in Latin America who want to nationalize their resources, invest in social spending on the people of their countries, uh, gain political sovereignty from, from the United States, things like that. So those, like, I think that that's, Again, it's a question of like looking at sources, critically thinking and asking yourself, you know, why, why am I seeing so much about Venezuela on the news? Why do I not hear about, you know, U.S. allies? Why do I not hear about how Jordan needs democracy? Saudi Arabia needs democracy. Uh, I, anyway, those, those two come to my head because they're monarchies, but there's plenty of other examples. A hundred percent. And yeah, it's all, yeah, yeah, we're yeah, these other countries. So why am I only hearing about this country or that country? And yeah, I'd also say with regards to Venezuela, part as well, another part as well that comes into it is just the U.S. mindset with regards to Venezuela, because the Monroe Doctrine is still in effect. We've consistently seen that country, or that rather correction, that continent, right, for a hundred years now as our backyard. Once again, massive quotation marks. You know. So this idea of, hey, you're doing something we don't want, and it's just like, yeah. It, <laughs> uh, but yeah, but uh, go, uh, moving forward, talk about Maria Corina Mercado, right? Who is she? What's her involvement in Venezuelan politics, and how would her policies result in undermining Venezuela's sovereignty? Yeah. So. Machado, like I said earlier, I, I mentioned her briefly. She's basically the figurehead of the opposition right now. There's over the past 20 years, as the U.S. has gone through these different iterations of like regime change attempts, they they always like trot out these weird people, and Machado is the person who they have sort of like put their hope in right now. Edmundo Gonzalez is standing in for her because she was not allowed to run in these past elections. Um, and like I said, Gonzalez is pretty much like Guaido. He's not very well known by the Venezuelan pe and people. Doesn't have a history of accomplishments or popularity. He just happens to be the person that they like chose to stand in for U.S. interests. But Maria Corina Machado was excluded from the elections because she had uh, connections to multiple past coup attempts. So I don't know if, if people are aware, but the U.S. in 2002, in 20. 19 uh and in 2020 maybe 2021 for the last one uh basically attempted on multiple occasions to overthrow the democratically elected government of venezuela in 2002 they overthrew hugo chavez briefly before massive demonstrations in the streets by his supporters brought him back to power he was kidnapped and then they ultimately after two days were forced to like return him uh because of these ma this massive movement in the streets to get him back. In 2019, that's when Juan Guaido came around. The U.S. basically, very similar to this year, they basically said the elections are fraudulent. We declared this guy the winner. 
it's even more hilarious in Guaido's case because he did not even run in the elections. He got zero votes, zero people in Venezuela voted for him. Uh, and yet the U.S. basically just decided, OK, this guy's the president of Venezuela now um, and treated him as such basically, you know, for the past six years. Um, to my point. Um, yeah. And then in 2020 or 2021, I can't remember the U.S., uh, a US an ex-U.S. Marine and uh, several other ex, you know, U.S. servicemen and a bunch of like a few hundred Venezuelan opposition people uh, staged an armed invasion of Venezuela, which was... Uh, Funnily, uh, you know, named the Bay of Piglets because it was sort of a Bay of Pig situation, but even kind of stupider and less intense because these these uh, armed, you know, insurgents basically were uh, captured by the Venezuelan army with help from like just fishermen who were off the coast of Venezuela. Within like 24 hours, they were all arrested. It was it was it was um, the coup attempt was foiled. But yeah, so Karina, Maria Karina Machado has connections to um, both of the, the, both the coup attempt in 2002 and the attempt in 2019. I believe it's the attempt in 2019 that she was like charged for and like basically the, the uh, Venezuelan justice system determined that she would not be allowed to run in future elections. Um, all of that aside, I want to talk a little bit about, about her policies. So you know, the Venezuelan opposition, especially online, like on Twitter and Instagram, you'll see people who are supposedly, you know, I, in some cases, I'm sure they are, but Venezuelan opposition members, and they'll say, this isn't a right wing or a left wing issue. This is an anti dictatorship issue. They'll say, you know, like, the opposition's not right or left wing. They just want democracy back. But if you scratch the surface of these people's program and you there's instances where it will sort of come out like documents will be published basically about what the opposition's plans would be if they came to power it basically entails two things one is the privatization of venezuelan industry including oil surprise uh which basically means you know selling off most of the oil rights in venezuela to big companies mostly american oil companies um and then the second part would be ending all of the social spending that's happening, closing the misiones, and which means you know halting these programs that provide people with housing, with nutrition, with healthcare, with you know literacy, education, things like that, and doing away with the communes. Though that is what the opposition would do if they came to power. Very quickly, they would privatize as much as they possibly could. They would end the social spending. They would close the misiones. They would get rid of the um, again, this is why they lost. They don't have a positive program of social change. They just have buzzwords about democracy, and behind it is more neoliberalism uh, and more capitalism, which Venezuelans and the whole world are tired of. Um, one last thing about Korea, uh, oh, about Maria Karina Machado, is that she, her, she, I can't remember if it was her party or her personally, but there was some uh, agreements that were made. One, she wrote a letter, I believe, in 2019 to Netanyahu personally when the previous election cycle happened, basically asking Israel to militarily intervene in Venezuela on behalf of the opposition. Uh, if you Google it, you'll be able to find it. I can't remember what the exact year is, but this is like well documented. Um, and also in 20... Uh, anyway, I don't, don't, don't quiz me on the year, but, but after that, her party also signed like a um a communique with the Likud party which is Netanyahu's party in Israel basically saying that we have the same vision for what democracy means for what human rights mean that for what progress and development mean um and the opposition has been very cozy and close with Israel um which makes sense because like Israel they basically operate as an arm of US imperialism um, I wish I had written down, I didn't write down those two things, but if you search up Maria Karina Machado Israel, you will find all of that and more. Oh, definitely. I'm going to include um, as well um, in the show notes. Okay. But yeah, the, um, <clears throat> but yeah, the, the whole uh, attempted coup in 2020 with the former, because I'm looking at it now from Wall Street Journal, right? The former Green Beret who went, right, tries to overthrow the Venezuelan government and it's pleading for the help from the State Department. It's comical, to say the least. Like, just because it makes you think, what's going on in these people's heads? Mm. 
Yeah, no, you know? it is funny. It's it, it's funny in one sense, and it's also not funny because you know the United States does have the power to like mess people's lives up, and a lot of people in Venezuela are struggling really hard nowadays because of the the continued sanctions regime, um, which you know the U.S. said basically and. Talk about election interference. The U.S. like accuses Russia and Iran and China of interfering in U.S. elections, but the U.S. basically has used its coercive power to try to swing the pendulum in the direction of the United States and Venezuela by saying, like, we're going to lift all of these sanctions that are, you know, making it hard to get food and medicine and basic everyday construction material, every, everything that people need to live a dignified life in Venezuela. They lifted them briefly around the time of the election and said, we're going to basically lift these if Venezuela gets its democracy back, quote unquote. When Maduro won, they basically went straight back to implementing these sanctions because they wanted to make it seem like it's it's Maduro, you know, like it's the PSUV that is causing this these shortages. And like I said earlier, I think a lot of Venezuelans are savvy enough not to be tricked by that. Uh, but I just wanted to say that is a, you know, a very blatant instance of uh, like election interference for the U.S. to say, we will sanction you if you if this person wins the elections. We will not sanction you if this person wins the elections. That's just you know a really wild thing for a country to do. Oh yeah, basically holding a country hostage. Yeah, yes. the the entire point of sanctions, as we you know, we already know, is just about trying to create internal instability so that a government um, may not necessarily be overthrown, but is significantly weakened. And if it gets overthrown, then that's just an added bonus. Um, so in more recent news, it seems that some of the Venezuelan opposition is holding up in, in the Argentinian embassy. So uh, just last year, right, Argentina went and elected Javier Milley. Uh, he's, you know, obviously a very libertarian dude. Um, and and so I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask how relations between the two countries have changed since. Uh, Mali's election last year. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of these governments, like, you know, Argentina has gone back and forth, like a lot of Latin American governments, between these, like, neoliberal, almost, like, libertarian sellouts like Millet, and then, uh, you know, in most cases, it's not like Venezuela or Cuba, where they have a genuinely popular socialist government, but these sort of, you know, leaders who are a little more interested in having sovereignty in national development, things like that. Um, so obviously the relationship with Venezuela has been warmer. I wouldn't say necessarily like great, but warmer uh, when these more like sovereignty oriented leaders like uh, Kirchner or other people like that in, in Argentina have been in power. Millet is, you know, extremely hostile to Venezuela's socialist government. Um, I don't have that much to say about Millet, but I'll just say this, you know, He's a very bombastic character. He's a big, he like, you know, gets up on stage with a chainsaw or whatever and like cuts stuff up with a chainsaw. <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, his program behind behind this, like this character is the same program that every right wing administration in Latin America has, which is neoliberalization, selling off, you know, privatizing public assets, free trade, cutting social spending. In that sense, he's a lot like the Venezuelan opposition, and it makes sense to me that they would be natural allies. In the end, they personally benefit from selling their countries out to American and European corporate interests. Um, and, you know, you can see in Argentina, there's a huge movement in the streets against Millet because he has done huge damage to the standard of even like, I don't know how long he's been in power, six months, eight months, but he's done incredible damage to the standard of living of regular Argentinians by doing exactly what the Venezuelan opposition wants to do in Venezuela, which is privatizing, cutting social spending, um, selling out to U.S. imperialism. And so I think it gives us a little bit of a glimpse into um, what Venezuela would be like if the opposition won. It wouldn't be the case as these, you know, um, opposition figures like to claim that Venezuela would suddenly become super prosperous and democratic or whatever. Like, are, we, we know what the program of the you know, right wing in Latin America is we see it in in Argentina. Um, we see it, you know, now in, in Peru with the coup government after they uh, got rid of Pedro Castillo. Um, there's plenty of other examples, but basically their program, like, like I've, I've said a couple of times, is ending social spending, 
ending anything that's of benefit to the working class and poor and indigenous peoples and selling everything to big corporations. So yeah, just the usual bull crap. Yeah. Just sell it all out and call it a day. The austerity measures, we'll call it. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, final question. Final question. Um, how can people learn more about what is going on in Venezuela and about the uh, Indy Liberation Center? Yeah, so uh, as far as Venezuela goes, shameless self-plug, read the article at hamptonthink.org. It's also on indyliberationcenter.org. That's I-N-D-Y liberationcenter.org uh, I, that I authored. Uh, it basically covers a lot of the stuff we've talked about in this podcast, but in a little more detail, and it focuses on the elections. Um, if you would like to learn, so it focuses really specifically on the election. So if you want to learn more about like Venezuela's history more broadly or about the Bolivarian revolution, I have a few recommendations for people. Um, one, just any alternative media, um, you know, is significantly better than watching the mainstream media in the United States. Uh, Telesur is the Venezuelan state media. And I appreciate that they, you know, cover a lot of just like the hijinks and like BS that the opposition has gotten up to in great detail. They debunk a lot of their mythology. Um, if you're not into Venezuelan state media, there's, uh, you know, outlets here, alternative outlets here in the United States. Um, Black Alliance for Peace, uh, they don't have as much on their recent elections, but they have some great breakdown uh, on their website of how Biden's policies in Venezuela are basically a copy and paste of Trump's for people who think, oh, like, you know, I care about Venezuela, I support the Bolivarian Revolution, but, um, you know, maybe the Democrats will not you know, mess with them as much as Trump. The fact of the matter is when it comes to Cuba, when it comes to Venezuela, basically almost, you know, across the board in terms of foreign policy, especially in Latin America, Biden's policy is a copy and paste of Trump's. It's the same. You can actually see this in the case of Cuba where, you know, Trump uh, towards the end of his administration um, instituted uh, hundreds of new sanctions on Cuba uh, on top of all of the regular sanctions, on top of the already existing economic blockade that exists. And then Biden has not overturned those. Uh, he's left every single one in place. And so that's ba- it's basically the same case in um, Venezuela. So I, I, like, I just wanted to point people towards th- that article. There's an article, I can't remember the title, but on Black Alliance for Peace's website about Biden's policies in Venezuela. Um, I would also direct people towards like breakthrough news. They have done a lot of really great, like shorter and longer clips discussing the recent elections in Venezuela and the history of Venezuela more broadly. Um, if you are into movies, if you're into documentaries, there's an excellent documentary that we watched at the Indian Liberation Center about a month ago called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. This is from 2003, and it covers the coup attempt in 2002 that I talked about earlier. Uh, where Hugo Chavez is kidnapped by basically the military in cahoots with the United States, like State Department. He's disappeared for two days, but uh, basically a massive movement in the streets uh, in support of, the, of him and of the Bolivarian Revolution brings him back. Um, it's kind of unprecedented in the history of Latin America. Like most coup attempts, it's very rare that a coup attempt is overturned like that. One other recent example is um, in Bolivia in 2019. Uh, there was a coup attempt uh, that after, in their case, it took a few months, but it was overturned by a popular movement. Um, so that movie is called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Great documentary. I'm not a crier, but I've, I cried when I watched that one. Um, <laughs> and if you are a book person, I want to recommend a couple of books from 1804 Books, which is uh, a left-wing publisher. There's one book called Commune or Nothing by an author named Chris Gilbert. Um which covers the, I really didn't get to touch at all on the communes in this, uh, in this interview. So I would, I'd like people to uh, look up and this is a great resource for that. Um, how the communes work in Venezuela. So commune or nothing by Chris Gilbert. Another great one is the irreversibility of the Bolivarian revolution by Jose Arreaza Montserrat. Um, so both of those are available through 1804 books. You can order them online at 1804 books website. Um, get to the second part of the question, the Indianapolis Liberation Center. Um, so I'm a member of Answer Indiana, which is a member organization of the Liberation Center. 
but the center itself is a physical and virtual community hub dedicated to advancing the causes of all marginalized, oppressed, exploited, and dispossessed people in Indianapolis and beyond by uniting and working to overcome the divisions imposed on us by the oppressing classes. So we engage in various kinds of educational, social, cultural, political, and other work. And our mission is to foster a sense of collectivity and revive our community's longstanding belief in the possibility and necessity of making uh, a different and a better world. Member orgs of the Liberation Center, we now have many. They include ANSWER, uh, IDOC Watch, that's Indiana Department of Corrections Watch, which does work uh, struggling against the brutalities and injustices of the Indiana Department of Corrections. Focus Initiatives and Focus Families, which are two organizations that work with people coming out of incarceration um, and families of incarcerated people. The Party for Socialism and Liberation, the Indiana Black Librarians Network, Hope Packages, which is a direct aid program that provides necessities to homeless people in the Indianapolis area. Arte Mexicano in Indiana, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that encourages and promotes Mexican art, music, and culture in Indiana, as well as Free Shaka Shakur, which is uh, dedicated to freeing political prisoners, uh, particularly uh, Shaka Shakur, who is a new African political prisoner who is originally from Indiana, but is actually living in internal exile at a supermax prison in Virginia. So sorry for the very long list of organizations, but I think it's cool to see how all of these different groups in Indiana have been able to come together to form this like really like coalition and this this like space, this working class community center that really is able to advance like the cause of working people in a way that in my lifetime at least has never existed in Indianapolis. Um, so we've been around since 2020, uh, but a year ago we moved into a new, larger, and more central space in downtown Indianapolis. Uh, we're at 1800 North Meridian uh, uh, Suite 305 for anybody who lives in Indy who wants to come see us. Um, you know, I won't walk you through everything, but we've held over 100 events in the past 11 months, which is a lot of work, and it's also really paid off. Uh, because we've made some real strides in developing like a political center uh, that marginalized and oppressed people in Indianapolis can call their home. Uh, so if you live in Indianapolis uh, or near Indianapolis and you want to get involved um, or learn more, you can either join one of our member orgs uh, or work for us as a volunteer. I would encourage people to stop by. We have weekly office hours almost every day of the week. Um, or check out our website, which once again is indieliberationcenter.org. That's I-N-D-Y Liberation Center. All right, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it was, I had a great time. Thank you for having me on. X is for Malcolm, Mr. L. Dahadzin. Y is for the youth. We need to organize them. Z is for Zimbabwe, Zulu or Zaire. Now I'm at my zenith, high up in the air. And I don't really care if I don't write no hook. As long as when you hear it, you go pick up a book and learn your history, and then you'll be alright. Fist in the air, peace and good night.